You're listening to The Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. Since the dawn of time, the food chain has been divided into two very distinct groups, carnivores and herbivores. The herbivores ate the plants and the carnivores ate the herbivores. We were really able to see this distinction in the dinosaurs over 65 million years ago. The dinosaurs died out, eventually paving way for man, the pesky little hybrid of a creature who consumed both plant and animal. The study of man's diet through the ages is a topic of much debate in scientific circles. Did we flourish as meat eaters, or are we meant to be herbivores? Outside of the scientific debate, there is a cultural clash between those who oppose eating animals and those that believe that our greatest path to health lies in consuming meat. Who's right? In this episode of the Complete Human Podcast, Jana and Evan explore the world of the carnivore diet with Dr. Paul Saladino, author of The Carnivore Code. Dr. Paul brings his incredibly well-researched position of life as a carnivore to this fascinating conversation of whether man is meant to be a carnivore or an herbivore. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. Uh, so you brought me this story a couple days ago, and you basically said, hey, there's this doctor that we need to interview who's a carnivore. And <laughs> all I could think about at the time was like a T-Rex. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, lo and behold, you kind of explained a little bit about our next guest. Uh, we got a copy of his book, which I believe is coming out pretty quick had a chance to just go through it really fast, and it kind of blew my mind. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce, actually, why don't you introduce him since you found him, and then sure. we'll get into this. So Dr. Paul Saladino, thank you for being here with us. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk about such an interesting lifestyle. I mean, I feel like this is definitely a, this is something that is very popular now. I mean, a lot of people have heard about this, but I think there's a lot of miscommunication, or more like misinformation out there too. I mean. There's just, just from reading your book, there's a lot of stuff that, um, you know, it's not just all meat, there's different tiers of this. And so this is what I think is very interesting. And I think we'd love to talk to you about today. So, um, I mean, I'd love for you to introduce yourself as well and maybe tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you're up to. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. It's fun to talk about it. This is, uh, kind of one of the, one of the coolest things I think to talk about for me, I, I've just been fascinated by connections between diet and human performance my whole life. Even when I was a kid, I was always curious, you know, why do people get atherosclerosis? Why do people get heart disease? And not a lot of kids think about that, but my dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse. And so I went to the hospital with my dad and was always curious, why is this person sick? Why do they have a heart attack? And pretty quickly things like atherosclerosis, plaque formation in the arteries became a fascination of mine in my early teenage years. And so I think I realized from an early age, hey, there's food involved here. And, and is it food or is it something else? Is it an environmental toxin? I was mostly a mathlete in high school, I hit puberty really late. It was kind of awkward. But once I kind of got my sea legs under me and, and, and could do some athletic stuff, I started running and lifting weights. And at that point, I just really was fascinated by the way that I ate and how that would affect how I felt, both athletic performance, physical performance, mental clarity body composition, all this kind of stuff. What I found was that a lot of different things didn't work for me. And I'll tell a little bit about my own story. I had eczema, which is this chronic autoimmune condition that causes these itchy lesions on the skin. I've had very bad outbreaks at times in my life and other eczema flares that are not so bad. Um, But I've had eczema and asthma, which these are kind of correlated as this A to P syndrome or this A to P um, spectrum within Western medicine throughout my whole life. And for my asthma as a kid, all I got from my parents was albuterol inhalers and theophylline in my applesauce, which really sucked. So they weren't, they weren't really thinking outside of the box and thinking, is it something about our son's diet that's causing him to have asthma? And, and but I did. Too, so. What's that? And your dad was a physician as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's funny how it all comes for a full circle. But when I got to, so I went to college at William Mary and studied chemistry and biology. And at that point I got really burned out. I thought I was gonna go to med school and I was like, heck no, I'm gonna go travel. I threw hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. I did some mountaineering, mm-hmm. did a bunch of skiing and backcountry skiing. I lived in a lot of cool places. Eventually the sort of the academic side of my brain turned back on. And I thought, you know what? I really like biochemistry. I like medicine. I wanna go back and do this. But I don't really wanna do it like my dad. He 
really had a hard time keeping balance in his life and overworked a lot as a physician. So I thought, I'll be a physician assistant. So not knowing much about medicine other than the fact that I thought it'd be fun, uh, I went to PA school. And I went to PA school at George Washington and then started working as a physician assistant in cardiology. I ended up working for a P as a PA for four years, but pretty quickly during that time, I realized I don't like this Western medical medicine paradigm. It really doesn't, doesn't jive with me. We are just using medications to treat symptoms. We're not getting to the root cause of the illness. And I worked with a lot of well-intentioned and very intelligent physicians who just couldn't ask those questions or wouldn't even allow me to entertain those questions. I was often directly told by the cardiologists I work with, like, think in the heart box. Don't think out of the heart box. Like, could you be any more reductionist? You know, don't, don't think about their gut or their diabetes or their brain or their bowels or anything. Just think about their heart. Treat their heart. Give them the medications that we know in cardiology that we use. Everybody gets their own little slice of the pie in medicine. That's how it works. And I thought, this doesn't really, this doesn't work. This isn't true. The more I learned about atherosclerosis, the more I learned it was an inflammatory condition. And then is the infl inflammation in the arteries in the heart coming from the arteries in the heart? I don't think so. I think it's coming from the systemic body. And I think that's related to food. And so that was really the beginning of me losing my religion. At that time in my life, I thought, oh, inflammation is related to meat. So I'm going to go on a vegan diet. Well, that didn't work out so good. I was a raw vegan for about seven months and I had the worst gas in my whole life. I was an absolute <laughs> factory nightmare to be around. And I shared an office with two other people who have now been canonized for smelling my farts for you know, years on end. And I also lost 25 pounds of muscle mass and I'm 5'10", 170 pounds right now. So I wasn't huge, but I was 140 pounds at that point. So I was very, very skinny on a vegan diet. It clearly didn't work for me and it didn't resolve my eczema either. I then kind of transitioned to a paleolithic diet, which I think is a really interesting way of thinking because it starts to ask the question that I continue to ask today and I think is one of the, the most insightful ways of thinking about diet and humans that we, that we can really pursue, which is how do our ancestors eat? And is what we're doing today evolutionarily consistent with that? And should we be doing more to mimic the way our ancestors are eating? And is it possible that a lot of the chronic diseases that we see today are the result of evolutionary genetic mismatch? Meaning the environment that we're in today with the food is not what our species is, you know, programming DNA is, is looking for. And we probably haven't had enough time for that DNA to adjust. And we're just, we're just in a zoo and we're not being fed the right food. We're getting really sick. There's no question that humans in 2020 are massively sick, exceedingly sick, and that chronic disease of all sorts, everything from diabetes to cancer to heart disease is rampant. That's the real pandemic, if you will. So I like this idea of a paleo diet. You know, our ancestors didn't eat grains, they didn't eat beans, they didn't eat a whole lot of dairy. Great, I cut those out, felt a little better. I definitely got some more muscles back uh, when I added some protein back in, but my eczema continued. And in fact, at times it got to be the worst it had ever been. There were times in medical school so I went back to medical school after being a PA. I went to the University of Arizona. They have a great program there in integrative medicine, which I thought would be a good start. I really wanted to think about things holistically and from an integrative perspective. So I studied with Andy Weil and these kind of you know, people who were the, the pioneers of what we might call integrative medicine, even within mainstream allopathic medicine at the University of Arizona. So my eczema was so bad sometimes in medical school, I would do jujitsu and it was all over my knees and my elbows that we get super infected. It prevented me from doing the things I wanted to do. I would often get massive eczema on my back, even my low back. I called it my eczema tramp stamp. It was just this eczema <laughs> tattoo back there. It was a real problem. So it was just thinking, what is going on? Like I'm, I've cut out grains and beans and dairy and I still have eczema. So I started cutting more things out. It still didn't get better. Then I finished medical school. I went to residency at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I had horrible eczema flares at times. I had you know, and I just kept cutting things out. And I realized, okay, wait, there's, I need to cut out oxalates. Well, maybe I should cut out salicylates. Maybe I should cut out saponins. Maybe I should cut out, you know, um, lectin containing foods. Maybe I should cut out this type of food or a histamine producing food or nightshades. And eventually I just got to the point where I was like, there are a lot of toxic plants. <laughs> Why are we eating plants? <laughs> and I thought that's crazy. We have to eat plants. And I heard Jordan Peterson on Joe Rogan's podcast saying, I cut out all the plants. I felt much better. His autoimmune resolved, his autoimmune disorder resolved, his sleep apnea improved. And I thought, that's crazy, but I'm going to do it. So I started on that, that journey about two years ago. It's been an interesting sort of uh, path. And wouldn't you know it, you know, I've been fascinated by animal-based eating and re-examining so many of the status quo ideas 
um, around meat and plants and what's healthy and what's not healthy for humans and what actually is an ancestrally consistent diet. What is a paleo diet uh, for a human? And perhaps it's a little different than what we thought or what a paleo diet quote conceives it as. But when I went carnivore two years ago, um, pretty quickly my eczema completely resolved. Uh, it's never recurred since then. I've seen this pattern time and time again and hundreds of clients and patients now. Um, I also felt immediately clearer mentally. It's hard to describe, but I just had more emotional poise. I felt more centered. I say that the, the, the propensity with which I was going to honk at people in traffic went way down. So like the, the honk at someone in traffic index went way down. It just felt better. And I thought, wow, if changing my diet with this can make me feel differently, there's something to this. What, are, what is going on with these plants? And that was really the beginning of my, uh, my research and exploration into this way of eating. There are so many things we are told in mainstream society that go against this, that it's been a, it's been a wild ride and we can get into any of those that you'd like. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you for the intro. And yeah. it sounds like it's been- It was a, a long intro, sorry. No, it's <laughs> no, a great it's intro. Um, it, it, and it kind of got me looking at the beginning of your book, thinking about the book Born to Run, which came out um, probably, what, 10 years ago? And it was really yeah. about the, the barefoot runners. But I, I remember the intro of that book talking about how humans are persistence hunters. And our evolutionary brain development and the exponential brain growth came as we started to hunt meat. Um, so. I love the context of how you bring that up, but I also want to talk about the dichotomy of this idea that we have this evolutionary diet that we should be doing. But I want to address the idea that at the time that you know we're persistent hunters and we start to take in this really carnivorous diet, our life expectancies were really low. So how do we address in your book, um, and again, we didn't get a chance to read the whole thing, but address this kind of idea that at one point we were very carnivorous, but our life expectancies were a lot lower. How do we bridge the gap between this idea that we can live longer and longer um, on a diet that really didn't have human beings pretty much living past the age of what, 35, 40? Sure, sure. So that's actually an incorrect, that's an incorrect statement. Um, if you look at currently, we don't know how long humans lived. Um, but what we know is indigenous hunter-gatherer groups living today, and we can look at the ethnog ethnographic record and the anthropologic record in terms of recorded human history. This is a common misconception that hunter-gatherer groups or people who are living this type of life live shorter amounts of time. It's, and I talk about this in the book. So there's a number of statements I make about this in the book with references. The life expectancy of most of these groups is skewed down because of higher rates of infant mortality. And if you look at currently living hunter-gatherers, if they live past the age of 14, they have the exact same life expectancy as modern, quote, humans. And in fact, even better than us, they have what's called squaring of the morbidity curve, meaning that their vitality, their ability to do all the cool things that we like to do persists way longer into life and then drops off very steeply at the end. Westernized humans so their have health this, span is longer. Their health span is longer, yeah. They have this, westernized humans in 2020, we have this inexorable march to decrepitude we have this gradual decline. You know, how many 50 year olds do you know that can do CrossFit? How many 50 year olds do you know that can, you know, surf or jump off diving boards? I mean, a lot of them can, but a lot of us are pretty darn limited, even at the age of 50, which is, you know, still has many decades of life left for most of these hunter gatherer groups. I did an interview with James Clement on my podcast and a number of other people. Um, Bill, Bill Von Hippel, we've talked about this repeatedly on my show, which is Fundamental Health, that, that this is sort of an insidious notion that's pretty widely mistaken that these people didn't live shorter amounts of time. Childbirth is traumatic and you can't really say that the average lifespan of humans is this shorter amount of time um, accurately unless you exclude all of this infant mortality. And the infant mortality is fascinating to think like, why are infants dying? Why are kids dying? Well, kids born in the wild die you know, more frequently than kids born in industrialized societies, mostly because of cleanliness and probably because of complications of pregnancy. Pregnancy is pretty traumatic for women. There's blood loss, et cetera, et cetera. So if we actually look at health span, which is what we're talking about here, of indigenous hunter-gatherer groups and of what we know um, of these anthropologic lineages and this historical facts, there's no evidence that cavemen live short lives. That just doesn't hold up. It's just skewed by this, this amount of childhood and infant mortality. It's a really important thing to correct. There's a number of references in the book. And then the recently, I don't know if you guys do screen shares. Are you going to post this video? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you let me do a screen share, I can show you an article here. Let's do it. By all means. Cool. So this is just one of the references. So longevity among hunter-gatherers, a cross-cultural examination. 
And in this article, they talk about this exact idea that um, throughout the lifespan um, of hunter-gatherers, there is a real, um, a real misconception that they die at earlier ages. But if you really look at it, most of the hunter-gatherer groups out there live to sort of the same lifespan as modernized humans without the, what I said earlier was like the decrepitude. So they looked at Ikung, Ashe, Agata, Hadza, Hiwi, Yonamono, Semain, uh, all of these groups, Waro, Tiwi, Ashe, Sweden, and you can compare them and, and see the, the rates of death and the, the lifespan. So it's a really important point to, to clarify, but there's pretty good evidence that in these groups, um, longevity and health span are equivalent. It's just that being born in the middle of the woods is kind of a risk for most humans. So yeah, that sounds like it. it makes sense. So it gives us some sort of an idea that it's not so much, you know, that they were hunting animals and dying early and therefore that's not a good thing for humans. And if you've ever been around indigenous people, you, you see this, I mean, there are very few of us get to spend time with these people, but if you see them, um, you, you really often can't tell how old some of the quote elderly members of the tribe are, and they often don't keep records. So perhaps it's a moot point, but you get the sense that, um, they're, they're quite old and they're pretty darn vigorous. So one of the things that I, I found fascinating in the book was this kind of idea that agriculture might be one of the worst human inventions of all time. Um, and so I'd love for you to expand on that as we kind of transition from, you know, the hunter gatherer, which in, at least I think from most people's point of view, hunter gatherer means, you know, you're hunting. So there is a significant amount of meat in, in a diet but you also have some grains, some berries, basically everything you're picking up along the trail. So let's kind of talk about the agricultural piece and then how the hunter-gatherer has kind of evolved to be predominantly carnivorous or omnivorous based off of your research. Yeah, so I wanna go back to something else that you mentioned. I'll show a graph from the book, which is the increase in human brain size. Um, can you guys see that okay? Yeah. yeah. So this is an interesting thing that you had mentioned, you noticed in the book. If we look at the size of the human brain and our previous ancestors, Australopithecus africanus or Australopithecus afarensis, to Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and Homo sapiens, we see this massive increase in human brain size proceeding over the last 4 million years. And what you can also do is kind of bring this line out further on um, our primate ancestors and realize that for 60 to 70 million years preceding human evolution, primates' brains did not grow. So this is a very unusual thing, and it represents a transition from one species to another. And as you're suggesting, I think there is a really large amount of evidence, like Chris McDougall talks about in Born to Run, and as I talk about in my book, The Carnivore Code, that coincident with this human size, this human brain size increase was the advent of human hunting. Whether it was persistence hunting or other types of spot and stock hunting, I think remains to be debated. But we do see evidence of stone tools and butchering on animal bones, these Acheulean tools, these bifacial tools, and evidence for mass graves of animals right about 2 million years ago when the brain started to grow looking at this cranial vault size. Some suggest that it was fire, but the latest evidence we have for fire is only a million years ago. So it doesn't really correlate. There's a, there's a huge million year gap and quite a bit of brain size between these two. So it doesn't look like fire caused our brains to get much bigger, but it was probably part of the process along the way. So the question that I address in the book is, okay, if hunting made us human, which is one of the theses of the book, um, how much meat were humans actually eating? We often think of our ancestors as quote hunter gatherers, but I think this is actually debatable. I think that it's really like hunter gatherer and that, that <laughs> most of what we were doing was hunting. And the position that I advance in the book is that throughout our evolution, and I'll suggest some evidence to corroborate this, humans have mostly, and hominid ancestors, have mostly sought out animals. And during times of scarcity or starvation or unsuccessful hunting, that is when we may have relied on plants. I think plants have traditionally been fallback foods or survival foods. It's not to say that humans haven't ever eaten plants, but we generally, I think, looked at them as survival foods or secondary sort of second class foods. And we see this pattern in currently living hunter gatherers today. The majority of the foods they eat are animal meat and a special type of plant, which is the fruit, which has a different purpose than the roots, stems, leaves, and seeds of a plant. So we can get into this later, but if you think about life from a plant's perspective, it doesn't want to get eaten except for the fruit. And that's really what we see in these hunter gatherer groups, whether it's the Hadza, the Kawi Menno of the Amazon, 
They generally eat animals nose to tail. So this is an important part of the work I'm doing, just helping people understand that these organ meats like liver and pancreas and spleen and kidney, things we're not accustomed to eating, but maybe heart, contain critical, unique nutrients that aren't really present in only muscle meat. So a carnivore diet or a carnivore type diet that I might suggest to people is not just ribeyes all day. It's very, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And it's, it's meant to be something that mirrors the way that currently living indigenous hunter gatherers eat and not the way that um, one might think of a typical carnivore or Viking just eating turkey off the bone all day and nothing else. That's not what I was, that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I think a lot of people assume that they're just like shoving like just, just pounds of steak down their throat every meal of the day, right? Um, but, and I was going to ask if you could touch on the importance between, uh, on eating nose to tail and like why organ meats are important. And this is funny too, because every Thanksgiving, my mom and I fight over the turkey heart and the liver and all these other organs and everyone thinks I'm crazy for liking that stuff, but I, I actually do really enjoy it. Um, but I'd love for you to touch on the importance of what, why organs are, are pretty important for this diet. You can imagine that with these stone tools and this hunting success that we were having 2 million years ago when our ancestors were able to get a kill and they were gracious to whatever sort of universal paradigm they were believing to be a part of, you know, they were not just going to eat like the haunches or the, or the you know, they were going to eat the whole freaking thing. Like that's your survival, especially if you take down a big animal. I mean, there were megafauna living 2 million years ago, woolly mammoth could feed a tribe for weeks and they're going to eat as much of it as they can. And so, and we see this, if you actually look at other animals that eat each other that are omnivorous or carnivorous, they often go for the viscera first. In fact, they almost invariably go for the viscera first. It's kind of gruesome and it offends our civilized sensibilities in 2020. But if you look at the way a crocodile eats an animal or a lion eats an animal, or even a, an orca eats a shark, they go for the liver and the organs first because there are unique nutrients there. And from our 2020 understanding of vitamins and minerals and nutrients that are needed to make a human brain, this begins to make sense because you don't grow a human brain eating plants. I, I really want to write a kid's book to let all the parents and kids know that you don't grow your kid's brain giving them broccoli. And the amount of consternation that can be saved in families across this country is en enormous. You know, like you grow a brain by giving your kids meat and animal foods and the nutrients that are in those foods. There are unique nutrients found in animal foods, specifically nutrients found in animal organs like liver and heart that are not present in plant foods. These are things like creatine, carnitine, choline, carnosine, DHA, EPA, B12, the full spectrum of K2, all of the metaquinones. These are critical. Riboflavin, these don't occur in any particular amount, in any accessible amount in plant foods. So there's a real inequality in terms of the actual biological evolutionary value of animal foods versus plant foods. And you can see there's lots of papers that have been written about this showing whether it was K2 or DHA or B12. Some research, researchers hypothesized that it was niacin that was the key nutrient. But I think all of these nutrients combine to allow the biochemistry of the human brain to proliferate for us to develop a neocortex, for us to triple our brain size over 10 million years. It takes energy, we need creatine, but it also takes specific nutrients. The human brain is made of DHA. And that's really important that we get it there and that we're getting a lot of it from foods. Choline is needed to make phosphatidylcholine, which is in every membrane of our body. So the list just goes on and on. We know from surveys of elderly humans in Britain that those who have lower levels of B12 in their blood have smaller brains. And those who have more B12 have bigger brains. It's a correlation study, so we can't draw a causative inference, but the, the pattern is there. And you can imagine that suddenly we have a huge supply of these massively unique nutrients that allows our brains to grow. And I talk about all this in the book. And the other piece that you're talking about with the organs is critical. If you look at muscle meat, it's nutritious. It has iron and zinc and B12 and selenium and some niacin. It doesn't have a lot of folate, doesn't have a lot of riboflavin, doesn't have a lot of copper. It's missing a lot of things that are present in things like heart and liver and other organs. And so to really get the full complement of what humans need, we need to eat these organs. Now, sometimes this is hard for people, which is why things like desiccated organ supplements are a good idea. It's one of the reasons I built this supplement company that we've just launched called Heart and Soil. But for a lot of people, you know, these are just totally gross, but they're incredibly nutritive. And the, the very, I would say, controversial statement that I make in the book, which I believe is totally supported by research, is that 
there is no nutrient that a human needs to thrive and be optimal that you cannot get from eating animals nose to tail. You can get glycine, you can get collagen, you can definitely get vitamin C. We can talk about that if you want. And you can get all these other really unique animal-based nutrients that don't occur in plants. And so eating animals nose to tail, I think is this, this very simple recipe for success. If you think about mainstream dietary health advice in 2020, it's so complicated. You have to eat this and this, and you have to sprout this, and you're gonna eat this to get this. I think about what it was like when I was a plant-based eater, when I was a raw vegan, there were only like two things I could eat that had any amount of zinc in them. And the zinc in those foods is not even that bioavailable. Like if you look at a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, you have to work so hard to supplement with no, like maybe 10 to 12 things to get an ideal amount of nutrients. If you just hunt an animal or eat an animal nose to tail, you'll get every single one of those things. And even things that we don't even talk about very much in mainstream nutrition, things like peptides and growth factors and other things that aren't even canonical vitamins and minerals. So you can see the formula becomes very simple for our ancestors. Hunt animals and eat them. Eat fruit when it's in season. If you starve, you can eat some plant foods that are not fruit, but generally speaking, that's what you're gonna do most of. And the last thing I'll add to that is if we look at at least recent history and what we know about the way people eat animals and eat plants, the majority of cultures that eat include plant foods detoxify them. They ferment them. This is kind of the origin of things like kimchi or fermented beans. These cultures realize, hey, these are not really ideal for humans. If we want to survive on them, if our plant foods are, you know, all we've got, if our animal foods are limited, then we better ferment the heck out of them. And interestingly, when you look at things like brassica vegetables, like cabbage, when you ferment this, the glucosinolates, which are the plant's toxins, get degraded. So I'm kind of going all over the place here, but you get the idea that these animals and their organs really complete the picture. And if we're only eating the muscle meat, of course we could get deficient. I think there's dirty quote ways to do every diet. There's dirty ways to do every way of thinking about food. You could say, oh, I'm vegetarian. I just eat chips all day. Or, oh, I'm keto and, and just eat you know, processed keto junk food all day. Or you could do carnivore, I think, in a way that's not evolutionarily consistent. But ultimately it comes back to this paleolithic way of thinking, this ancestral way of thinking like, how did our ancestors eat and what is our body expecting? And the, you know, I'd say the status quo challenging hypothesis I'm suggesting in the book is mm, a lot of these parts of plants that we think are good for us are not really things our ancestors would have favored. And there's a whole section of the book about this too, which is that so much of what we've been told about red meat being bad for us is based on shoddy science. So, uh, that's all fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I, I think one thing you brought up, which I, I really want to address, is the DHA EPA component. Um, and when we look at you know the modern Western diet, the omega six to omega three ratio, which has been really kind of demonized as being hyper pro inflammatory, and I think we can see that with you know all the canola oils and everything like that. Um, is there enough of those polyunsaturated fatty acids to be found in a traditional carnivore diet, or when we look at the evolutionary biology of people, wasn't there a contingent of human beings that were always close to water and subsequently had a lot of the cold water fish that we seem to you know, see in more of? And I, you, know, I, you talked about the blue zones in the book and I definitely wanna get into that, but I really kinda of wanna address this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio and recognizing that from the research that I've seen that there's really not enough of those polyunsaturated fatty acids in a typical, let's just say cow, right? From nose to tail, that you do really have to incorporate more cold water fish into a diet. And I use Dr. Jorn Dyerberg's research with the Inuit population as kind of the, you know, the catalyst for, you know, recognizing that the cold water fish or the, you know, or kind of those polyunsaturated fatty acids do have a role in an evolutionary diet. So if that were the case, how did uh, Native Americans in the middle of the United States thrive? Well, that's a great question. And so I, I guess my, my response to that is, did they thrive from a... I think they did. Yeah, I mean, you know... So I'll, I'll answer your question. I'll let you respond, but then I'll answer your question. I think there's a lot of evidence for cultures that do not incorporate seafood that thrive. Um, but I didn't know if you had other things you wanted to add to that before I respond. No, no, no. I, I definitely think, you know, and again, I think that the, the academic debate is, is, you know, can you, um, you know, definition of thriving, but, you know, more importantly, do you need red meat? You know, when we look at like the Inuit population, which is clearly shown to thrive, how do we separate out, you know, a red meat diet or a carnivore diet from more a pescatarian diet? Oh, the red, the Inuit were not pescatarian in any way, shape or form. They ate seal and whale, but they also hunted caribou and had other land animals. So I think what, what we're, I'll try and address what I think you're, you're driving at here. Um, in 2020, the amount of linoleic acid, which is an 18 carbon 
polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid that humans get is massively evolutionarily consistent. And I think as a single driving factor, there is nothing greater at driving underlying metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance than excess linoleic acid in the human diet. And I think the problem with the omega-6 ratio is not that we're not getting enough omega-3, it's that we're getting way too much omega-6. If you see the biochemistry, which I'm sure you're familiar with, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids share the same synthetic pathway with a series of desaturases and elongases. And so when we get too much omega-6, too much of that linoleic acid prevents us from making the omega-3s. So it's not that we're not getting enough omega-3, most of us, unless we're eating fully processed food. It's that we're getting way too much omega-6. And I can pull up some research in infants that shows this. In pregnant mothers who eat too much linoleic acid, which is basically the majority of pregnant mothers on the planet in 2020, the babies have trouble incorporating DHA into the brain because the linoleic acid inhibits this. So this is a real problem. And I think that it's, again, not so much that we're not getting enough DHA. And I would actually contend that recommendations to super supplement the diet with excess omega-3 are harmful to humans. And I can show some evidence for that. That if we use fish oil and processed omega-3s, those become highly oxidized in the human body. So I would um, disagree respectfully with your assertion that we can't get enough omega-3 from ruminant land animals. Uh, a cow's brain, for instance, is full of DHA as there's also a good amount of EPA and DHA in suet, in all of the fat in the animal, in the bone marrow, and in many of the organs. So there's a lot of it. So I'm not sure what metric uh, researchers are using for how much EPA and DHA humans need to thrive, but I can tell you that lots and lots of fish can create actual problems for humans if we get too much of the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Regardless of the source, can I share a couple of articles I'll show you? By all means. These are pretty cool. So this one is tissue levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids during early human development. Um, and you can see that the DHA arachidonic acid ratio was outside the normal range in the liver, but within the normal range in the brain. And that what they found here um, was that the more linoleic acid that these kids got, the more disordered this DHA to arachidonic acid uh, ratio was, and that the formula fed infants and infants fed TPN that was high in um, this linoleic acid. So this is the uh, the linoleate, which is the linoleic acid to alpha linoleic acid ratio um, was pretty profoundly different in the way their brains developed. So this is what I was talking about with maternal um, linoleic acid and DHA arachidonic acid. These are both very important fatty acids in a developing brain for kids. And it's not so much that mothers are not getting enough DHA unless they're just eating bagels and cream cheese or bagels and um, donuts, but it's that they're getting way too much of the linoleic acid. So this is another thing that is not often talked about, but I'll just share as a point of caution. So this is a paper showing that there is lipid peroxidation during omega-3 fatty acid and vitamin E supplementation in humans. And they show that um, supplementing the diet with omega-3 fatty acids resulted in an increase in lipid peroxidation. They measured it as plasma malondialdehyde and um, lipid peroxide products. This was not suppressed by vitamin E supplementation. So it's just one of the, the pieces of research that gives me pause when the recommendation is to overly supplement omega-3s. And this one, I believe, is another study. This is a mouse, or excuse me, it's a rat model, but it shows the same thing, which is that um, there is an increase in tissue lipid peroxidation and the peroxidizability index after uh, the consumption of too many of the omega 3s. So these are all omega 3s, right? Alpha linolenic, icosapentaenoic, docosahexanoic acid intake in rats. Um, there was an increase in lipid peroxidation index. So I think there's a balance here and that if we're supplementing with omega-3, this is not evolutionarily consistent. Omega-3 occurring in foods like fish is sort of packaged into a food matrix and probably in some ways protected from peroxidation. But I do think that if humans get too much omega-3, just at a very basic biochemical level, we're going to have a hard time defending that from oxidation and that levels of omega-3 in humans are primarily driven by excess or um, you know, an absence of linoleic acid. And that's the real deciding factor for most people if they're eating a quote whole foods diet. And again, I think we need to mention that if you're getting omega-3 from plants, if you're getting alpha linoleic acid, uh, most people are not very good at converting that to EPA and DHA. There's a study that I mentioned in the book uh, where they gave people lots of flaxseed meal and alpha linoleic acid in that. And there was essentially no EPA or DHA recorded in that human. So 
a lot of these plant-based nutrients are not the same as the animal-based nutrients. The, the preformed EPA and DHA in animal meat, animal fat, like suet, bone marrow, brain, or even egg yolks is, I think, where we need to be getting this from. I agree. I think we both agree. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny, you know, I've developed prenatal vitamins for years and I really focused on DHA supplementation and prenatal, um, but it was always in my mind, uh, and, and kind of agree with Rhonda Patrick is, is that, you know, it, it's not the quantity, but it's the structure. And so by pairing things with a phospholipid or a structured, uh, a structured lipid, uh, like alpha GPC, you know, cause again, you know, choline by tartrate, choline salts, a lot of the things that I think that we see as choline supplementation in the market have zero impact on brain metabolism. And that's been proven kind of clinically uh, time and time again. So it's, it's the, the phospholipids. And I think that we see, uh, you know, obviously from eggs, that's a big one liver, but um, people always used to ask me, well, how do you get alpha GPC? I'm like, well, you either have to supplement with it or you have to eat a cow's liver. And unfortunately at the time there weren't a lot of people eating cow's liver. So I, I love what you're saying. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully we can change that. Now, one thing I do want to address, um, I think is fascinating is you talk a lot about some of the, what would be considered like anti-inflammatory or, you know, antioxidant uh, products that we see typically in the market, things that, you know, like resveratrol that I know David Sinclair is very big on quercetin, all these things. Um, and, and I think you make a very compelling case on why those aren't necessarily good. But then conversely, I want to look at the evolutionary diet and say that, are we at a time where we've cocked up our environment enough that the diet that was very, you know, um, you know, was really good for homeostasis a million years ago, 500,000 years ago, needs to evolve to deal with a lot of the environmental toxins that we see as a species today. And are some of those things that you talk about in the book, those resveratrols, those things, you know, that, that really have some cellular protective benefits, um, are those not necessarily as bad as maybe, you know, the book says they are? So this is a little bit of a, a quagmire that we can try and clarify for people. So there's a lot to dig into here. The I ask really long questions sometimes. <laughs> it's okay. It's complex stuff. The thesis that I advance in the book is that these plant molecules are innately defense molecules. They're not made by plants to benefit humans. They're not made by plants to benefit anything, really. Resveratrol specifically is a phytoalexin. It's a plant defense molecule made in response to the botrytis fungus on the skin of grapes or peanuts. So it's not made as like this magical plant gift to humans to make us better. Now, what's interesting about many of these molecules at a very, very basic level is that we realize this. They are not antioxidants. That's, that's organic chemistry really 101 and it's a factual uh, incorrect. It's, in, it's factually incorrect. Uh, oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. For something to be an antioxidant, we generally would consider that as a molecule that is going to donate an electron to a molecule that is missing an electron within a certain orbital. So that would be something like a free radical or a lipid peroxide. If you're going to give that molecule an electron, that would be an antioxidant. It's important for the listener to understand that plant molecules do not do this. This is not opinion, it's not conjecture, this is organic chemistry, physical chemistry, science. Plant molecules do the reverse. Resveratrol does the reverse, sulforaphane does the reverse. It pulls electrons from these molecules and creates free radicals. Well, how can it be so mixed up? How can it be so different? Well, I'll explain why we're so kind of misled on that perspective, but these molecules are pro-oxidants. They are molecules that get into our bodies and pull electrons from molecules, creating free radicals and creating lipid peroxides. There are multiple articles that I reference in my book that show that resveratrol creates lipid peroxides, products of oxidation. Now, why are we told that this is an antioxidant? Why are we told that sulforaphane is an antioxidant? Why are we told that any of these molecules is an antioxidant? Because when our body sees this happening, there is an antioxidant response element in our cells called NRF2 which is a transcription factor connected with uh, sort of a carrier protein called KEEP1. And that molecule then dissociates from KEEP and NRF2 moves to the nucleus and transcribes genes involved in the antioxidant response. And many of those genes have to do with the formation of endogenous antioxidants like glutathione, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, these sorts of things in the mechanism. So it is true that some of these molecules will upregulate our own endogenous glutathione production. People say, aha, see, hormesis. Well, this is my contention. This is my contention. 
it's redundant. We don't need it. And there's really no evidence to suggest that in the setting of a good life, well-lived, this does anything better for us than we could otherwise. This is where I think we run into what I would term uh, a very bad misunderstanding. And we are conflating what I term in the book, environmental hormesis with molecular hormesis. So I'll explain what I say is the difference here. Environmental hormesis is, I believe, where we got this concept from. Things like heat and sauna, sunlight, exercise, these are environmental exposures that can cause a small amount of oxidative stress. There's evidence that these cold water swimmers in Berlin actually drop their glutathione a little bit and then rebound the next day with higher amounts of glutathione. So this is environmental hormesis. I can go to the gym and go in the sauna and then a cold plunge and get environmental hormesis, okay? But the thing about environmental hormesis is I'm not inducing a xenobiotic molecule into my body like resveratrol or quercetin or curcumin or sulforaphane. There's no molecule involved here. This is environmental hormesis. I can exercise and generate oxidative radicals. I can generate oxidative stress. I can generate reactive oxygen species. There's no new molecule coming in. It's an environmental exposure. And that, I believe, is how humans have sort of shored up, increased our own antioxidant defense capacity. This is why exercise is good for us. This is why sauna is good for us. This is why cold plunging is good for humans. These are environmental hormetics. When we get to things like sulforaphane, resveratrol, curcumin, quercetin, the equation is completely different. And I disagree strongly with David, who's a personal friend of mine. I've had him on my podcast about this. This is what we might call molecular hormesis or xenohormesis. And the problem is that within the research, the side effects of these molecules have been broadly ignored. Meaning that when you go to the pharmacy to get a medication, and neither of you probably gets medications from the pharmacy, but most of your listeners will understand this, or you buy something from the pharmacy, you get a package insert of all the side effects of that medication. When I was a PA in cardiology and I was giving people beta blockers or statins, they would get a package insert with side effects. And it would say, this medication can cause memory loss, problems with libido, muscle pains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because it is all these other collateral things, death, arrhythmias, yeah, problems, right? Well, why do we think that plant molecules are so benign? Many of the drugs we use are derived from plants. Metformin is derived from a French lily, aspirin, the list goes on and on. So many of the drugs, the joxin, they're all derived from plant molecules. Many of them are derived from plant defense molecules. Paclitaxel, all of these, you know, all of these cancer therapies are derived from plant molecules that are meant to be bioactive plant defense molecules. So why do we think that sulforaphane or resveratrol or curcumin or quercetin are any different? Because they're not. And this is the evidence that I show in the book, that if you actually look at the other side of the equation, which is never talked about because this is sort of the nice, neat supplement sort of story, these molecules wreak havoc on our biochemistry in other ways. In the case of resveratrol, it's you know, touted because it activates NRF2 and also because it turns on sirtuin genes. Well, it also decreases androgen precursors, which are not a good thing because those are things like DHEA and testosterone in males, and it worsens glycemic tolerance. It actually worsens metabolic syndrome because resveratrol looks just like estrogen in the human body. If you look at the structures, which I depict in the book, resveratrol is a xenoestrogen. What are other xenoestrogens? Oh, I don't know, things like PCBs or phthalates or BPA or any of these other horrible plastics that you don't want to put in your body. Those are also xenoestrogens. Well, people are shoveling in resveratrol, which is another xenoestrogen and has all sorts of bad hormonal effects. Well, then someone might say, well, the risk is worth the benefit, except it's not because you can turn on your sirtuins just by fasting. Just by doing time-restricted eating or being in ketosis, your sirtuins turn on. Sirtuins are sort of turned on based on the NAD to NADH ratio. And we know that during times of fasting or you know, ketogenic diets that are low in carbohydrates, we can affect this NAD to NADH ratio. We can see this in the brains of humans. We can see this in the brains of mice. This is, again, not conjecture or opinion. This is actual science. We can see sirtuins turn on in ketogenic diets. For a a great example, it's like, why would we do something that has a negative side effect with a redundant benefit? And then the list goes on and on. In the case of curcumin, people will say, oh, it's an anti-inflammatory. And I'll say, yeah, maybe this molecule, just like ibuprofen or uh, Aleve, which is naproxen, or any of these other you know, anti-inflammatory, quote, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can abrogate the prostaglandin cascade. But what else is it doing in the human body? Would you take uh, ibuprofen for a heart attack? No, we don't do that, right? Because we know that it can affect the kidneys negatively, it can affect the prostaglandins in the stomach and lead to ulcers, it can have all sorts of bad side effects. If you look at the research for curcumin, it's positively terrifying. 
curcumin affects p53 which is a major tumor suppressor gene negatively it affects the genes that wind and unwind dna the topoi isomerases it affects the herd channel which is a potassium channel in the heart the list goes on and on curcumin is not a benign molecule in the heart in the in the human body i think i'm gonna go throw away our curcumin sample that's right <laughs> <laughs> it's not a benign molecule and as i say in the book with curcumin the question should be what is causing the inflammation in the first place we also need to unpack the, just the notion quickly that reactive oxygen species and reactive oxygen signaling in the human body is necessary and important, and we use it, and we shouldn't completely eliminate all of it. There's good research that if you do a workout and then megadose vitamin C, all the benefits of that workout, are not, you're not going to get them. So we need oxidative stress. That's part of how we live. But too much of it is something we don't want. So if people are using curcumin as an anti-inflammatory, my question is, what's causing the inflammation? Why don't you correct the root cause? Why use something just like ibuprofen? We know that taking ibuprofen for inflammation is a bad idea and long-term will cause lots of problems. You should correct the root cause. If you have a problem with your toe, if you have a splinter in your toe and you're taking ibuprofen for the splinter, why not just take the splinter out, right? <laughs> right? You're going to get side effects from the ibuprofen. You don't just take curcumin for inflammation. That doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, curcumin is a really fascinating story, and I'll just go down this rabbit hole for a moment because it illustrates some of this very well. Our body is pretty smart. Most of these molecules don't get absorbed much in humans, and we have to go to great lengths as supplement manufacturers or within supplement manufacturing to make these molecules absorbable. People will know that curcumin is almost always packaged with black pepper or piperine, and the reason for this is that our body is smart. It says, I don't want that in my body. It just glucuronidates it. So in the liver, there's phase one and phase two detoxification, and in this phase two detoxification, the liver adds a glucuronide moiety to curcumin and gets rid of it. What does piperine do? What does black pepper do to curcumin? Black pepper and piperine specifically inhibits UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is an enzyme in the liver that glucuronidates things that the liver is trying to get rid of. So if you eat black pepper with your meals, black pepper being a seed, being one of the things that I think is most toxic for humans, you are not able to glucuronidate anything in your body that it wants to detoxify. And one of those can be curcumin. Therefore, the levels of curcumin rise to 1,000 or 2,000 times and all those bad side effects happen. Now, a good side effect might happen too, but then the question becomes, why are you taking it in the first place? Isn't this a redundant benefit with a net loss? I would say it's not worth these things. There's plenty of evidence to suggest this. You can pick the molecule. So forothane is another one, which is a great example. It's derived from the glucosinolate glucoraphanin when animals chew brassica plants. So sulforaphane doesn't exist in broccoli seeds. It's a pro-oxidant. It can't. It would harm the broccoli. It's only there when an animal chews those seeds. It's like a booby trap from Goonies, booby trap. And it's only when the myrosinase combines with glucoraphanin that you make sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is a pro-oxidant. It's not an antioxidant. It's pro-oxidant. Triggers NRF2. You get a little more glutathione, which most of us don't need in the first place. And then sulforaphane circulates around the human body and prevents us from absorbing iodine properly at the level of the thyroid. Have you seen those pictures of the women and men in Africa with the really big, thick necks, the goiters? That's from goitrogenic compounds like sulforaphane, things like goitrin or allyl isothiocyanate. Those are people eating low iodine diets who are getting lots of isothiocyanates. Rhonda Patrick would be super happy, but they're about to die because they have such bad hypothyroidism, right? So the, the, the trade-off here is just silly. We don't need sulforaphane to have enough glutathione. It's clearly been demonstrated. So in the book, I, there's a series of studies I show that you can do both things. You can do fruit and vegetable adding, or you can do fruit and vegetable deprivation from someone. And these are not people on carnivore diets. These are people on just standard American diets, I imagine. We should do this experiment with carnivores. These are some of the most fascinating experiments I've ever seen. So they'll generally take people and divide them into two groups. One of them is 12 weeks long done in Denmark, and they'll take one group that eats a very small amount of fruits and vegetables and say, don't eat any vegetables or fruits for, for 12 weeks. The other group is going to eat lots of fruits and vegetables every day. They're going to get lots of sulforaphane, lots of resveratrol if they're eating grapes. They're going to eat lots of these compounds. Maybe they're eating turmeric. They eat Jerusalem artichokes. They eat real vegetables. At the end of 12 weeks, they look at it markers of inflammation, markers of DNA damage, and markers of oxidative stress. They're no different between the two groups. The vegetables didn't do anything. So it just argues, like, do we know that there's a benefit to these? And then they can't even look at all the other metrics that the vegetables might be harming in a negative way. So this is really the point that I'm making with the book, is these plant compounds have been touted as magical phytonutrients, when in fact, they're really plant defense chemicals. They're plant defense chemicals that we've gotten all wrong, and we've put on these blinders and said, oh, we're only going to look at the benefits of these molecules. Nobody's going to think about how they might be harming us. But when you look at what they're doing to harm us, it's like, wow, they have all these side effects. I just posted something on my Twitter today. The antioxidants found in cacao, berries, and green tea 
it's, it's a rat model or a mouse model, but in a rodent model, they actually worsened colon cancer. They worsened colon cancer. And so you're thinking, okay, what is going on here? Now, do I think a handful of berries every once in a while is gonna give someone colon cancer? No, but it, it paints a very different story that these molecules are not necessarily helpful for humans. They're not friendly for us. They're from a plant's biochemistry, not from human biochemistry. And it's really important to realize that plant molecules like this don't participate directly in human biochemistry. They come in, they kind of poke the bear, they change our biochemistry, but there's no point of human biochemistry where we need sulforaphane. It's not a vitamin, right? It's not like riboflavin or folate or selenium or copper. Those are completely different. These are plant molecules. These are plant signaling molecules that kind of just come in and gum up our biochemistry. And we have phase one and phase two detoxification. We can get rid of them, we can tolerate them, we can survive with plants, but are we really going to thrive with plants? And my assertion is most people are just not gonna do as great with plants. Now, again, my idea here is not to tell everyone in the world to stop eating all plants. It's to number one, realize that animal foods have been incorrectly vilified. And number two, that plants exist on a toxicity spectrum. And I think we've got them all wrong in terms of how we're looking at them. A lot of people with recalcitrant illness, persistent autoimmunity, depression, psychiatric issues, skin issues, who haven't seen this spectrum of plant toxicity might really benefit by cutting out the plants that are most toxic, whereas they're shoveling down, you know, sulforaphane pills, thinking I just need more fiber, more sulforaphane, it's probably taking them in the wrong direction. There's really no benefit to these things. And if you do the other things that most of us should be doing in our lives, it's probably just already there for you. I'm sure this is just mind blowing for so many people to hear this, right? I mean, we are taught eat, you know, six cups of fruits and vegetables every day, get your antioxidants, you know, I'll be honest, our supplement cabinet is just, you know, antioxidants galore, vitamins, minerals, everything. And, you know, this is, this is definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm really thinking about how. <laughs> it, well, it, it, I think it was interesting as I was perusing your book last night, there's a, there's almost a reactionary response to some of the information that you provide. It's like, it's kind of like waking up and, you know, someone telling you that the sky is purple. You're like, no, I know it's blue. Um, so as we're talking through this, I, I really love the passion behind this. And I love the science because I, I think, you know, our followers, our listeners love the science. We talk a lot about this and there's so much that you've brought to the table on some of this. Um, I, I don't want to play devil's advocate, but I kind of do uh, on some of these things. And so you talk about the plants, you know, a lot of the plant um, things that we just discussed here. So from an evolutionary standpoint and from the food pyramid standpoint, or from the food chain, isn't there, you know, the, the idea that at a certain point, if we're further up the food chain, that we would ultimately be imbibing some of those plant toxins anyway? You know, an animal, you know, an herbivore is going to eat some of those plants. We're going to eat that animal. Ultimately, we would end up consuming those. Like you eat what your food so, eats, right? You eat what your food so eats. So where do some of these plant toxins exist on the food chain scale? And, and how is the human, you know, how is the human biology designed to ultimately incorporate some of those things, if at all? Or is it basically broccoli was never designed to be a plant that people, people or animals should eat? Hunter-gatherers don't eat broccoli, man. <laughs> like brassica vegetables are, no, no, no hunter-gatherers eat brassica vegetables. They're like, that stuff's garbage. Why would we eat that? That's not food for humans. It's been made, kale has a good publicist. What can I say? Like it's been made into a food. The interesting thing about humans eating animals is that the animals detoxify these things and excrete them for us. We don't, they don't really bioaccumulate. So fluorophane doesn't bioaccumulate in a human. It doesn't bioaccumulate in a cow. Uh, because a cow is like, I don't want this either, but they're just way better at detoxifying it than humans because it's all they eat for their whole life. They only eat plants. They've evolved only eating plants. If we go back to one of the first things I talked about, humans look like we've been meeting mostly animals our whole life. I mean, that's my contention with the anthropologic and the fossilized evidence. We're not really well adapted to these plants. We can get by. We can put the donut on the car if you get a flat tire and limp over to the gas station so you can hunt some more animals, but they're not really going to be a primary fuel. And you can really get this, you know, the, the animals that are herbivorous are eating these foods. And then you can, you know, you can, they'll detoxify it for you and they'll excrete most of it. And it's not really like eating the plant foods in the same way. What they will do on the flip side is incorporate the nutrients in those plant foods that they can incorporate. They're better at digesting. For instance, humans can't eat grass. Life would be way easier if we could. I wish we could. Um, I mean, imagine. I wouldn't need a yard guys. guy for then. Yeah, right? You, yeah. <laughs> It would be so much easier. There would be so many 13-year-old boys who didn't have to ever mow the lawn. Yeah, like if we could eat grass, but human, you'll die. Like you can't, we can't process the silica in grass. You can't eat grass. So, but ruminants can. It's a magical thing that like, you know, in Sweden and Norway, 
humans can't eat lichens, but we can eat the caribou that eat lichens and they're really delicious. So caribou and, and cows and bisons turn really crappy tasting greenery into delicious steaks and liver. And I love what you said earlier about the choline and how very few people get enough choline, but then it makes me think, well, that's why we should be eating organs. <laughs> that's why things like desiccated organ supplements, like we do at Hardened Soil are so important, or just eating the real thing, like that's why it's so important because we need those nutrients. But like I said earlier, from plants, we don't really need the nutrients in plants, we can do without them. We can get by, you know, if we're on, you know, if, if, if the three of us are in a tribe and we're out somewhere and we can't get any food, well, we're gonna go looking for some fruit or something to get us through, but we're gonna start sharpening those arrows and hope that we get an elk coming into camp or something. So it seems like um, the carnivore diet is a lower carb diet naturally, right? Is there a difference between the carnivore diet and a ketogenic diet? Well, yes and no. So traditionally people think of a carnivore diet as a low carb diet, but it doesn't have to be. So in my book, I talk about these different tiers of carnivore diets. I realize that the for majority of people, eliminating all plants is not reasonable. And I don't think most people need to do that. I think they just need to understand there's a spectrum of toxicity. But I do think there are parts of plants, like I suggested earlier, that are less toxic, like fruit, um, that, are, that can be included and can give people carbohydrates. I, with regard to ketosis, I believe it's a totally normal, natural, healthy state for humans in a cyclic fashion, and that our ancestors experienced it during times of starvation or during times when they didn't have fruit and they were just eating animals you know, on a low-carb carnivore diet. But I think that long-term ketosis is not so good for humans biologically primarily because it's very hard for us to maintain our electrolytes without some more robust insulin signaling. People think of insulin signaling as bad, and it's just not. It's very physiologically healthy and good. You don't want to become insulin resistant. That's a whole different pathway. But humans need insulin signaling to maintain electrolytes. And so for the first year and a half of my own carnivore diet, I was zero carb. And I felt pretty good in the gym. I had good performance mentally. I slept well. But more and more, I had problems with electrolytes. I had cramps, I had palpitations, and I thought, okay, I'm going to reincorporate some carbohydrates in my diet. The, the carbohydrate that I find to be the most interesting and um, beneficial for me and easy to digest is honey, which you could even make kind of a tongue-in-cheek argument that that's an animal-based carbohydrate. Like, it's not a fruit. It's from bees. I mean, some vegans don't eat it. So if a vegan doesn't eat it, then it's probably okay for me to eat. <laughs> so who knows? You know? But, you know, basically, I, I'm not dogmatic about a carnivore approach, but I include honey in my diet and I have for the last five to six months. And that's made it much easier to maintain my electrolytes. Mm -hmm. Now, people will say, honey is going to, it's too much sugar. It'll make you insulin resistant. And one of the things that's fascinating is that I, um, is he going to get some honey? <laughs> no, I was just checking the sound levels. I wanted to make sure, but keep talking. So one of the things that I like about honey uh, is that it's, it's an, like an animal-based carbohydrate and doesn't have any fiber, which really bothers my gut and the gut of many people. So while I was doing honey, I stopped, uh, I wore a continuous glucose monitor from NutriSense and you could show that like my fasting glucose remained low. I'll get a slight bump with honey. It returns back to normal very quickly. This is normal human physiology. After months and months of eating honey every day, I haven't become insulin resistant. I recently did labs. My fasting insulin is less than three micro IU per ml, and my C peptide is 0.43. So there's really no evidence. My fasting glucose is 83. So I'm not insulin resistant. There's no evidence that I'm insulin resistant with honey. Uh, there's too much carbohydrate phobia. There's too much fructophobia right now. That's a whole separate podcast that we could do. But if people want to do a carnivore diet as a low carbohydrate diet, you absolutely could. Um, there's a real difference between a ketogenic diet per se and a carnivore diet just in the foods that are included. A ketogenic diet might have a lot of plant-based oils. It could even have vegetable oil or canola oil, things that no one thinks are good. But the problem I have with a ketogenic diet is that <clears throat> it, doesn't, it usually doesn't have enough protein. It doesn't have enough of the nutrient-rich animal foods that you need. I, I fear that a lot of people on ketogenic diets are leveraging very powerful physiology but do so in an overzealous manner and chase ketones at the expense of macronutrients, specifically protein and micronutrients. So I think that without making animals a significant part of our diet, including the organs and liver, uh, however we can do it with real organs or the desiccated supplements, we're going to become micronutrient deficient. And I fear that happens a lot on ketogenic diets. I don't think there's anything super magical about ketones. Uh, I think we're supposed to have them from time to time. I think alternating between sort of catabolic and anabolic physiology is normal for humans. We need some autophagy, we need some house cleaning. 
Uh, one of the things I've noticed is even eating over 100 grams, 120 grams of carbohydrates a day, uh, because my last meal of the day is in the early afternoon or late afternoon, I wake up in the morning in ketosis. My ketones are almost always above 0.5 millimolar. So every day with ketones in my diet, with my animal-based and honey carbohydrate, you know, carnivore diet, I'm, I'm in ketosis. So I think there's benefits to it. I think humans are supposed to be low carb from time to time, are supposed to have periods of fasting. I think we're supposed to deplete liver glycogen overnight, and that is supposed to shift our physiology, but I don't think it's necessary all the time. And I think that carbohydrates are perfectly healthy for humans, and I don't think they cause diabetes. That's not been demonstrated ever. So Paul, that's a really interesting thing that I took out of your book is it seems like you're an advocate for kind of daily intermittent fasting, but you seem to really push that as have your last meal of the day early and then do your intermittent fasting, you know, kind of through the night where I think a lot of things that we're seeing, uh, you know, from intermittent fasting is, you know, wait until, you know, have it like your last meal at seven and then wait until noon the next day to eat. Have you found in your research that there's one, one that works better than the other? Just personal anecdote and working with clients, I think that we know that melatonin and insulin are a little bit sort of competing hormones. And so spiking insulin late at night is probably not going to be the best for your circadian rhythm. So I think that the earlier in the day that you eat, a lot of people may experience better sleep. And I've seen this in clients and friends and personally with things like aura ring and sleep tracking and all this stuff. So I just find it to be easier. I have somewhat of a flexible schedule. I can eat breakfast and a late lunch. Uh, I think a lot of people find it more convenient to eat one meal at work and then eat dinner with their families. But I think physiologically, there's some good evidence to suggest that the earlier we eat that last meal of the day, the better. One of the problems I see people running into is that when they do that noon and eight o'clock meal or noon and six o'clock, they're eating pretty late at night, which can definitely disturb sleep. And in the morning, they're doing a big you know, coffee with a bunch of oils in it, which I don't think are very beneficial for humans. The liquid oils, I'm not a big fan of this. And coffee, I'm not a huge fan of in general. So they think that they're fasting, but really like, Coffee with oil is not, it may keep you in ketosis, but it's not quite the same in terms of setting that molecular clock as it were. And so I don't think of that as fasting or in the same like autophagy mechanisms as no food at all. And I just feel like it's people getting excess liquid fat calories, which aren't that beneficial for humans. I would rather they use that caloric budget with nutrient rich whole foods. So, you, So you're really advocating for almost like no sugar and no coffee. Um, do you have a bodyguard? Well, yeah, I actually just talked about honey, so it's all right. <laughs> honey is, you know, I, I think honey is great. Um, and fruit is okay too. But yeah, I'm, I think between my, my suggestion that people avoid coffee, that's probably the most, that's the thing that's going to get me uh, uh, pilloried. I was just about to ask about the coffee thing. Is it the antioxidants in there that, what, what is it about coffee? It's a number of things. So every time you say antioxidants, you have to do this from now on, right? Because you know, they're not really antioxidants. You have to do the air quotes, at least just humor me. Um, but <laughs> so there's a lot of things about coffee that are problematic for me. There's, there are these polyphenolic compounds in coffee, specifically caffeic acid and chlorogenic acid that I have concerns about, just like other polyphenolic compounds like resveratrol or curcumin uh, in the human body. But coffee is also burned. So it's also a roasted plant seed, which creates acrylamide. It creates heterocyclic amines. It creates products of cooking. Uh, unless people are eating or drinking very curated coffee, the coffee is likely to have mold toxins and pesticides on it as well. So there's a lot of issues I have with coffee. Um, and then we didn't even talk about caffeine. That's different than caffeic acid. So uh, though caffeine is, quote, ergogenic and nootropic, I think most listeners will understand that any substance like that comes at a cost. And in a way, whether we're talking about Hooperzine A or whatever nootropic, caffeine, whatever we're using, I think of it as borrowing tomorrow's happiness today. And you really need to be careful that you don't run into this kind of hamster wheel type effect. If you, if you stop your coffee and you can't function, there's a little bit of a dependence there. And I just worry. I mean, ultimately, Guilty. all of this is just about helping people live the highest quality of life. And I'm not about giving people that answer for them. I'm not going to tell anyone what determines their quality of life. And there are a lot of people who lead very high quality lives with coffee. And I have a lot of brilliant friends who love to tell me that they're poisoning their adenosine receptors, which is the molecular mechanism of caffeine every day, gleefully with coffee. And I think that, you know, every day we're all going to die anyway. So it's not that I'm trying to advocate for complete asceticism in humans. I just want people to understand that these, what from my perspective, as best as I can contribute in a productive way, the type of things that may be contributing to human health and that might actually be taking that away from people if they're not aware of it. So 
um, yeah, it's like anything else. A lot of you people ask, like, what about alcohol? And I think, well, that's clearly not good for anyone. But they say, yeah, but what's the best, what's the least bad kind? Okay, as long as we're talking about, like, what's the least bad type of coffee? That's, that's the framework for this. What's the least bad type of alcohol? It would be like vodka or one of the clear spirits that's highly distilled rather than wine with, again, mold toxins, pesticides, things like this. So. But some of those discussions, I think we would have to accept that, hey, this is, this is fun and it's not great for me, which we all do things like that. You know, we all stay up too late watching the fireworks or watching the Northern Lights. That's not great for us either, but it enhances our quality of life. I realize they all make those decisions. And I'm really not as much of a monk as it sounds like in this podcast, <laughs> believe me. Right. And, and I think that's one of the things that I took out of your book was that it, it, it didn't come across as preachy, right? It's not like you have to do this. You were just outlining, you know, you were giving people information and giving them a roadmap to make those choices, um, which I find fascinating because there's a lot of these diet books that say, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to die tomorrow. And I, and I don't really feel like you did that in your book. I think that there was just great information and allowed people uh, the ability to make the choice. Uh, so a couple of things that I wanted to touch on as we talk about playing devil's advocate, because this is this is so fascinating. I imagine, you know, I noticed that Dave Asprey was one of the, uh, um, you know, one of the quotes in your book. And I imagine you guys have probably had conversations about coffee and, you know, and all this. So um, I've had conversations with him really about the environmental impact of cattle. And that's kind of one of the things that I think is if, if we really advocate for kind of more meat in our diet, does that mean that we have to expand our cattle? Um, and in that respect, isn't there some science that dictates or says that, you know, cattle are much more environmentally catastrophic than, than anything else? Have you ever been to a monocrop farm of corn or soy? Uh, yes, actually I have. Pretty environmentally catastrophic, my man. Oh, Pretty totally. environmentally catastrophic. And I'll be clear that I am no fan of factory farmed agriculture, nor am I advocating for that type of agriculture. I make it very clear in the last chapter of the book that there is a clear way forward here and it is regenerative agriculture. It is grass feeding, grass finishing of cows with rotational grazing. And this is a type of farming of ruminants that mirrors the way that these animals have lived on the earth for millions and millions of years. In 1850, there were 250 million ruminants in the United States alone. There have always been millions and millions of ruminant animals on this planet. They did not destroy the planet and they're living in a, in, ancestrally, environmentally consistent way. If you put thousands of them into a small paddock and they pee and poop all over each other and you feed them grains and corn and soy and cookies and plastic, uh, yeah, that's not a good way to raise humans or animals. Um, so there's a clear delineation here. And I think people need to understand that the vilification of cattle as a, as a whole misses a key nuance. Uh, nuanced piece here. So there are lots of things to unpack here, and a lot of it is based on inconsistent, badly reported science. The whole last chapter of the book is about this. What we do know is that within regenerative farming, and there have been life cycle analyses done by basically as, as unbiased a company as you're going to get, like General Mills, showing that regenerative agriculture sequesters carbon into the soil, meaning that Cows, ruminants raised on regenerative farms are carbon negative. Nothing else can say that. <clears throat> Beyond Burger, Impossible Foods, corn, soy, these are all carbon positive. Animals in ecosystems are carbon negative. That's how the Great Plains became the most fertile part of the United States. It was these hundreds of millions of ruminants peeing and pooping there, eating grass, moving and grazing. And that's what regenerative agriculture does. It takes these paddocks, it moves them around the farm. If you've ever been to a farm like White Oak Pastures in Georgia that does regenerative farming, they look nothing like a factory farmed clustered animal feeding operation or a CAFO. They don't smell like it. It's just green grass and healthy cows chilling. And you're like, that's really cool. They've also got these like herding dogs that live with the cows or the sheep and are bonded to them. And so it's not, it's just like, and you know, there's a farm out here in Texas called Rome Ranch that has a couple hundred buffalo. And you go out on the farm and it's just a buffalo in a field. And you're like, that's really freaking cool. And it's scary because you can walk right up. To, I stood like two feet from a buffalo. Um, could have killed me. You know, it's a massive animal. The head is the size of my torso. And, and so it's just this crazy, it's just a different way of living, right? It's like you and I are Indians or Native Americans on the plains and we're hunting buffalo. And we're like, that's beautiful. There's a herd of buffalo down there. It, it's happening. It's not a CAFO. And so then the question becomes, or the assertion, which I would respond to, 
is you can't scale that. And you absolutely freaking can. That's absolutely incorrect to say you can't scale it. There's absolutely tons, there's hundreds of thousands of acres in the United States that could be used to expand our production of these animals. It's important that everyone understand that almost every single cow, even if you bought that cow at, at Costco and it's grain finished and it's spent time on a factory farm, lived 85% of its life on a field, on a pasture. It was grass fed. And then it was taken to a factory farm. They don't raise cows their whole lives on factory farms. They were taken to factory farms because the US government subsidizes corn and soy. And farmers know that in order to make a profit, in order to stay, to stay actually afloat, to stay you know, soluble, to stay salient, to stay actually sustainable in their finances, they have to feed cows corn and soy because of the way the corn and soy are subsidized and because of the marketing of these cows and because these foods, because processed food is subsidized. When you can get Twinkies for $2 and you can get a steak for six or eight, what are people gonna buy? Most of the time they're gonna buy junk food. So the, the inaccurate deflation of the cost of junk food and the, you know, at the expense of actual whole food, I mean, how much is a pound of grass-fed ground beef? Five or $6, maybe eight? That's actually pretty darn affordable. But when you're comparing that to Twinkies, why are Twinkies so cheap? Because the farmers growing the corn for those Twinkies or the wheat for those Twinkies are subsidized by the federal government. So we, the federal government has really created this with farmers. The other problem is that there are hundreds of thousands of acres as part of the conservation reserve program. This is a program that pays farmers who have monocropped the crap out of their land and made it completely unfertile with monocrop agriculture to leave their land fallow for decades. They're paying farmers to leave their land empty. What could we also be doing on that land? We could be raising animals because how do you regenerate land? How do you increase the amount of minerals in the soil? You need animals on it. So any assertion that cows and ruminants are harming the planet is just based on CAFOs and factory farming, which no one is supporting. And we have to vote with our dollars. If you support regenerative agriculture and you've seen these farms, you should see the dirt on these farms. There's a video on my Instagram at White Oak Pastures with Will Harris, who's the owner. And in one jar, he has the dirt from his farm. Another jar, he has dirt from his neighbor's farm, which is 25 yards across the fence line. They're completely different colors. The dirt from his farm is like dark chocolate. The dirt from the other farm is like milk chocolate or like really, really light. It's like you can absolutely see this huge difference. His neighbor's farm, 0.5% carbon in the soil. His farm, 5% carbon. It may not sound like a lot, but every 1% of carbon in the soil holds an inch of rain during a rain flooding event. If you get five inches of rain, his neighbor's farm is going to erode. All the water is going to go right off, make everything from the topsoil go into a lake and stream and river and destroy that ecosystem. It's all going to go into the ground on Will's farm because there's so much carbon in the soil. How did it get so much carbon? They've been regenerative farming for 12 years, for 20 years, excuse me. And they have graphs, and these graphs are in the book that I reproduced from White Oak Pastures with their permission. You can see every year the amount of carbon in the soil goes up. That's how you create soil. You need animals on an ecosystem. So in fact, completely contrary to what the mainstream media would say, ruminant animals, deer, pronghorn, elk, antelope, buffalo, cows, these are how we make soil. This is how we make the earth fertile for future generations. I think there's no greater metric that will suggest the persistence of homo sapiens on this planet rather than soil carbon. If we monocrop, we're dead. We're just, we're dead. You can't grow plants without animals. And growing a bunch of corn and soy makes no sense. Those are not nutritious foods for humans. And they're going to ethanol. They're going to feed grain-fed cattle. They're going to junk food manufacturers. And they're destroying the soil quality. Our ancestors have always known this. If you look at the quote on the Hard and Soil website, it's basically one of the most profound quotes I've ever heard is like, you belong to the land. The land doesn't belong to the you. You, we belong to the land. We are from the land. And we don't think about this a lot. Soil isn't super sexy. But when we die, our bones go into the earth. Not so much anymore because we're, you know, hermetically sealing our bodies in these, these you know, fake sarcophagi. But our ancestors and every animal that's ever died on this earth went back into the earth. And that's what is supposed to happen. So we belong to the earth. We're connected with the earth. And if we forget that, if we forget how important the soil is, we're all dead. The land doesn't belong to us. We belong to the land. And cows and ruminants, man, they've always been a part of this. They're part of the ecosystem. So that's what regenerative agriculture seeks to do is it recreates those ecosystems and it's totally scalable. It's just that consumers need to know about it and need to value it. We need to give consumers a reason 
spend $8 a pound on meat or $6 a pound and forego the $3 for 12 Twinkies. I have a feeling that Avatar might be one of your favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I was talking about it the other day with my friend Aubrey Marcus and we were like, that's a good movie. I mean, I, I just like being in the woods, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, I got to tell you, I, I was... Um, your book fascinated me last night, and, and I was I knew that this was going to be an interesting conversation just simply because there are so many preconceived notions about things like that. You, you've really done an amazing job of kind of debunking. Um, the environmental piece with cows is a perfect example. Um, I know that, you know, we talk a lot about methane, and, and I grew up I grew up in Greeley, Colorado, which is where ConAgra's, one of Con, ConAgra's largest feedlots were. So I'm intimately familiar with what, uh, you know, a, a feedlot looks and smells like. And um, so, you know, I've always had this kind of misconception about, you know, feedlots and what cows could do. So I really appreciate that, you know, that explanation. Um, I, I, this has been fascinating. My, my mind's kind of blown. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think all of us think are true. And what we've been taught over the years. And there's a lot of information out there, honestly. And it's not always aligned. So, I mean, it's good to have the science out there. And I appreciate you taking the time to explain all of this because now I have a lot of research to do too. <laughs> it's a fun, it's a fun place to be. You know, I think it's great. I'm grateful to be a part of the conversation. Uh, I think that there's a lot of misleading information out there. And if uh, I think that if, if what I'm suggesting in the book is true, if even half of what I'm suggesting in the book is true, there's a major sea change that needs to happen in terms of the way we look at animals, the way we look at plants, the way we look at agriculture, and my hope is just that it will affect, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives positively because the way it's going now, I just fear that people are going to suffer because of bad information and a lot of propaganda, things like game changers and things like that, and absence of important foods like meat and organs in their diet. I mean, I have a niece and a nephew. I don't have any kids, but they're the cutest things in the world to me. I might be biased, but I don't want them to suffer. You know, I want them to have the best nutrition. I want my parents who are in their 70s to, to live as well as they can for as long as they can. And so... I think we all, it hits home for us with our families. Like this affects the quality of life of everyone we know. And if we're given bad information, man, we're just living in a, in, a, in a gray world. We're living in a world that's not as rich or as you know, vibrant or as enjoyable as it could be. We're only on this planet for like 70 or 90 years of 50 billion. You know, we might as well make these years enjoyable. And just as a physician and now as an author and a, a, an influencer, there's just so many people suffering. And I think, wow, I hope this helps some of those people suffer less because it's pretty cool outside, you know? Like I just want to run around the woods barefoot and, and go build <laughs> forts and jump in rivers. And I want everybody else to be able to do that too or whatever they enjoy. And you can't do that when you're, when you're you know, like a, a normal 70-year-old, quote unquote, or even a normal 50-year-old in our society because we have this decline in our vitality, this inevitable launch to decrepitude. And uh, that's, that's just tragic for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. I mean, is there anything else we want to touch on today? The, no, honestly, the, the there is so much. Yeah, yeah, so this... much. I think almost, I think it'd be great to, to actually do this again. And, and uh, you know, I, I mean, there's just so many other questions that I have, but we're kind of short on time here. So if you'd, uh, if you'd like it, we'd love to have you back. Absolutely. I'd love to talk about it. I like talking about this stuff, you guys. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Absolutely. So uh, the book is Carnivore Code. It comes out when? August the 4th. I think when this interview comes out, it'll already be a New York Times bestseller. Fantastic. Well, in that case, awesome. congratulations. Yes. Um, we will put the link to all of your information in our show notes. Uh, guys, uh, definitely check out uh, Dr. Paul uh, Saladino. Uh, I'm assuming you're Italian, right? I am Italian. Yeah, my dad's family is Sicilian. Yeah, you can check out the book. The link is thecarnivorecodebook.com. If you want to check out our desiccated organ supplements from Heart and Soil, you can go to heartandsoilsupplements.com. And my website is carnivoremd. Wonderful. Doctor, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys for having me on. All right. Talk Take to care. you soon.